no way. This is how, uh, no, no need to switch off your videos. I won't be pointing it out. I point out in the class. <laughs> so if you, if you can answer, it's fine or else we'll go about it. Uh, when I used to take class, I used to point out uh, the students that you will answer, sir. You will answer. Okay. So <clears throat> forest officer, forest offense, forest produce. When they ask you, you are stumped in the interview. When they ask you, what do you mean by forest produce? You will say, sir, timber, Shahed, honey, tendu patta, this is. This does not look like a coherent answer. And when you answer, sir, in the section two of the Indian Forest Act, forest produce is defined as this, 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 this. This shows that you are, uh, you uh, know these things. You have studied. You come across as a knowledgeable gentleman. So let me open that act. It's a big act uh, dealing with everything from uh, the definitions to the reserve uh, forest, the protected forest, village forest. Everything. So the first one, uh, the first thing in this act is the definitions. In, in every act, the section one is the extent of the act, the section two is definitions of the various terms that are used in the act. So here, uh, three important things are defined. The first one is forest officer. Who is a forest officer? They can ask you in the interview, who is a forest officer according to you? So this act defines that forest officer means any person whom uh, the state government or any officer empowered by the state government in this behalf may appoint to carry out all or any of the purposes of this act. So any officer who is appointed by the state government to carry out the functions under this act, who, that is a forest officer. So it does not mean IFS and above or ACF and above or ranger and above, any person. Even if you employ a watcher and you give an order in writing that he will perform such and such functions, he is a forest officer. The definition is important because in the subsequent sections of penalties and offenses, there would be sections that the forest officer can this, 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 can do this, can seize the vehicle. So who can seize? Who, who has the power? Ranger and above, ACF and above. So in some of the sections, it is any forest officer. So even the water or the guard, they can also file a case against a person who is violating the law. So this is about forest uh, officer. Uh, the second one is forest offense. Forest offense means any offense punishable under this act. So this act has many offenses, which will uh, we will see uh, subsequent in subsequent sections. So any offense, any violation of this act which is punishable, that is a forest office, uh, forest office. And the third important definition is forest produce. In forest produce, it comes, uh, uh, it is an exhaustive definition. It includes everything. It includes four things. Let me share this also. Can you see this? Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the forest produce, it includes the following, whether found in or brought from. So even if it is outside the forest area, they might ask you that somebody is carrying magua seeds, yeah, but he is outside the forest area. Is it a forest produce? Can you arrest him? So even if it is found in or brought from a forest, it might be brought from a forest or not. That is to say, timber, charcoal. If these are the things, they need not be brought from the forest. You found them. You find them anywhere, and they are forest produced. Even if they are not brought from the forest, but these things, they are either found in or brought from the forest. So you have to prove that it, it has been brought from the forest. Who has to prove? We'll see. Uh, the presumption of offense clause. We'll see that clause also. 
so these are the things timber charcoal katachu this is katha this is made from acacia katachu then wood oil resin natural varnish bark glass mahua flowers mahua seeds and all they are forest produce then trees and leaves flowers fruits and then plants not being tree then wild animals and skins tusk horns if you find a tusk in anyone's home that is a forest produce you can straight away straight away arrest him under this act as well as the wildlife protection act and then peat surface soil yes this is if a trolley uh, uh, is going through your forest check post yeah, it is not necessarily in the forest area yeah, but uh, it is coming from the forest yeah, outside the forest there is a check post yeah, and it is a uh, it is filled up with sand soil or rocks can you see that vehicle yes because even these things found in a forest they are forest produce and to extract them you need the permission you need a valid permit okay this is how mining in forest areas is regulated fine so these are the three important definitions so uh, the other definitions are uh, definitions are not much relevant from interview point of view from uh, your perspective okay. uh, then comes the reserved forest what are uh, reserved forest hmm. firstly uh, section 3 it defines the power to reserve forest who can declare the for forest as reserved forest it is a state government the state government may constitute any forest land or waste land which is a property of the government this is important uh, when you see the power to reserve forest it is the government can declare only those lands which are forest land or waste land which is a property of the government if it is not a property of the government the government has to get proprietary rights it has to acquire that land and then it can declare as a forest land like private land it has to first acquire them and then do this Uh, under section 4 the government declares a notification the process though it is not important for you but it uh, declares a, it declare first it comes out with a notification saying that such and such area is to be declared a reserve forest if anyone has any rights or any objections they can contact the following officer they appoint a forest settlement officer and the collector and all so the persons they can approach that my land is coming in this i am being uh, i am cultivating we have a, we have been grazing our cattle there we have this rights we have that rights we have been drawing water from the pond there so any kind of rights if you have you can contact the forest settlement officer and then the officer determines the nature of the rights and then they will uh, give either either the compensation or any uh, anything uh, any mechanism uh, for those rights they will first inquire if they are valid rights then the nature and extent of the rights and then can you be given those rights so this is the thing uh, the other sections are not very important the sections important are first one is who can declare a forest as a reserve forest and secondly uh, what are the things that are prohibited in a reserve forest uh, section 26 i'll show you this screen again Are you comfortable with me changing the screens? Is it fine? Yes, sir. Okay. If any problem, any time, just tell me. Okay. Yes. Sir. I had made a small presentation, but I did not have time to make detailed presentation, and it does not make sense to include all these sections verbatim in the presentation because presentation is indicative. these indicators so i thought i would uh, write indicative things on the ppt and then show you the section so this section again is is the power to stop waste and water courses in reserved forest but not uh, much important from an uh, interview point of view this is in a reserved forest what are the acts that are prohibited what makes it a reserved forest when they will ask you what is a reserved forest so this is your answer that an area which is declared under section 3 by the state government in an area where these things are prohibited first is you cannot 
clear the uh, forest, clear the trees. You cannot set fire to the uh, forest. You cannot trespass or pasture cattle. You cannot cause any damage by negligence by, to felling any tree, fell, girdle, log, tap tree, quarry, stone, burn. This all, this stops everything. All this mining and all, everything stops. Clears or breaks up any land for cultivation or any other purpose. In contravention of any rules made in this behalf, okay, uh, hunt, shoot, hunting, shooting, poisoning, this is prohibited. And then the other act, the Elephant Preservation Act and all. See, the activities punishable in these acts, they also cannot be done. If you violate these things, there is an imprisonment of six months or a fine which may extend to 500 rupees or both. Okay. So this is what is reserved forest. Just pay attention to this and I will show you the protected, uh, protected forest also and just uh, see what is the difference between the two. Village forest is the third category, which is not very important. The state government assigns this status to any of the village forests which are maintained by the community, but they are not significant in number. They are not very popular. This is what is important. So this again is declared by state government only, the protected forest. No, it's not. One second. One second. I'm sorry, this has to be taken. This is from a superior. Yeah. Sorry, ah, was from my boss. Yes, so <coughs> protected forest. This is the second category of forest under the Indian Forest Act. The highest uh, protection is reserved for the reserved forest. This is this these forests protected forests enjoy a lesser degree of protection because here the rights not to abridge or affect any existing rights of the community. The rights of the communities are not abridged. If you are enjoying any existing rights, they are not abridged, except with due process. What the government can do is they can reserve certain trees. If trees are important, they can reserve that these and these trees are reserved and you cannot cut them. Otherwise, the rights are not completely extinguished. Here also there are penalties, but penalties only for the uh, contravention of section 30. What is section 30? Section 30 may we reserve some trees. Power division, motivation, reserving trees. Okay. So if you do this, then there are uh, punishments and causing fire to these trees. Okay. So felling these trees, 
setting fire to the forest, leaves burning, filling in tree, permits cattle to damage any such tree. So these are the provisions with regard to protected forest. Not much important. The most, uh, the highest degree of protection is for reserved forest. There are very few areas which are designated as protected forest and even fewer as village forest. Okay. So this is about the reserved forest and protected forest. Section 29, who can declare in section 30. Uh, 33 the penalties for contravention of section 30 that is reserving the forest reserving the trees in protected forest this section is important what are your powers under uh, this uh, indian forest act 1927 can you seize the property can you release property can you can the forest produce be seized who can do this then counterfeit uh, counterfeiting or defacing boundary marks Then, can you arrest without warrant? Can you prevent commission of offense? So I'll again change the screen. And you can see the provisions yourself. Yes. Penalties and procedures. So seizure of property. So, if there is any property which is where there is a reason to believe that a forest offense has been committed in respect of any forest produce, such produce together with all tools, boards, carts, everything can be seized by any forest officer or a police officer. This power has also been given to police officer, but in forest areas, we exercise this power in various ways. So you can seize everything, tools, boards, carts, cattle, any vehicle also. Every officer seizing such property shall mark, shall leave a mark and then present it uh, present a report to the magistrate. So this is about the seizure of property. Seizure of property liable to confiscation and procedure thereof. When there is a reason to believe that forest officer uh, offence has been committed, the forest officer shall seize these articles. Yeah, any article which is used in committing such for. Even if you have a suspicion that such and such person has committed a forest offence, you can seize any any vehicle, any arms, any tools which are done in that, uh, which are utilized in that. And any forest officer seizing, making such seizure shall make a report to the DFO. DFO does not go and seize. So, uh, yeah, uh, take, uh, uh, keep this in mind also. Whenever you are asked in a question that there is a forest officer uh, offense committed and you are the DFO, what will you do? Do not say that I will go and see. You do not do this. You are submitted a report. Usually the ranger and the deputy ranger, they do this. So you will facilitate this. You will ask the ranger and all to act on these provisions. Okay, this is about the procedure, how it is done. This is not important for you. This is about the procedure only. This section is still important. Power to release property. So if any forest officer who has seized any article or any vehicle and all, if, there, if you have seized, you can release it on production of a bond. This is what is misused by forest officers for corruption. So if, if they ask you, what are the things that you will do to reduce corruption in forest? One of, one of my friends was asked, what, what steps will you take to reduce corruption in forest? So these are some of the areas where you can focus, apart from the usual generic answers of, sir, technology, that is fine. But if you can give some specific answers, uh, nothing better than that. This is again about the procedure, uh, how, how to release that. Again, section 55, forest produce tools, 
any forest produce that you find that it is not validly legally uh, extracted from the forest you can uh, confiscate that is why we established forest check post naka so we established check post and all the vehicles passing through that uh, those check posts they are thoroughly searched and if you find that there are trees and uh, the uh, driver of the vehicle the owner cannot satisfy you that they are not from the, either not from the forest area private area or they have a valid permit if they are from the forest area you can straight away see that truck straight away see the timber because it is the presumption is on them they will prove that it is from the forest area then section 62 all these sections are not very important yes this is a an important section what if uh, now some of you might have been uh, started thinking that these are wide provisions and they can be misused so there is a provision which is there so if, even if you ask you are asked in an interview that forest officers are misusing their powers and harassing people and uh, even if you answer you, you gave the previous answer and you uh, get a counter question that uh, are you not harassing the people so then you can say that sir uh, there is a section 62 that has a, uh, a provision of punishment for wrongful seizure so if i make a wrongful seizure i may be given a punishment for an imprisonment for 6 months or a fine 500 rupees so this Uh, pro provision is there to prevent any uh, misuse of the provisions again this this is regarding the encroachment encroachment is a very frequent uh, uh, very important problem for the forest officers and very frequent question in the interview you will see if there is an ifs officer he might as well ask you uh, there are high chances that he will ask you a question on uh, encroachment that what, uh, what are the provisions for encroachment what are the punishments for encroachment encroachment of forest land because uh, uh, you see uh, the population is constantly increasing the land is not there is no revenue and revenue land that the collector can give to people so where is the land land is with the forest department land is power everyone wants to grab that government land in other with other departments the land uh, they don't have any more land especially the revenue department the collector had the power to give away the revenue land to people Yeah, but there are no revenue revenue lines now. All of that has been given in 70s, 80s, 90s. So what they do is they encroach, and this is a uh, sometimes in some areas the encroachment is an organized problem. Like uh, there is a uh, division in MP Burhanpur. There it is an organized problem. There are organizations that pay people to uh, do encroachment, and they say that you don't worry if there is a case against you, we will defend you. We have lawyers, we will defend you. they are paid for the encroachment of forest land so this is the punishment this is counterfeiting of the uh, of a timber or standing tree or any boundary mark this is about any boundary mark if you remove the boundary mark uh, all the forest uh, boundaries they are marked with the boundary pillars so what the encroachers will do is they will approve the boundary pillar see and then encroach that land and then start cultivation so this is the provision that uh, forbids it and it has a provision of uh, imprisonment for 2 years so this is what you will do uh, and uh -huh. and that is uh, uh, the, uh, if they will ask you how will you tackle encroachment that is a situational question that we will deal with later how to deal you don't have to be that dabang and rowdy uh, forest officer you sir chale jayenge ek ranger leke aur sabko bhaga denge no this is not a mature answer and you also will not give this answer so what you have to do is uh, anti encroachment drives are very very sensitive because see you are there to implement a law they are there to save their houses some are organized encroachment but some are people who are living there for around 10 15 20 years they have constructed their house yeah. provided uh, accepted that uh, the status of the land is illegal uh, status of possession is illegal this is an encroachment but if you have constructed a house spending 5 10 lakh uh, lakh rupees and you are there with a jcb would they give it easily no yeah. so it is a very volatile situation encroachment and it, uh, it needs to be dealt with much care yeah. i will share with you a case study which we were told in the training by uh, a very efficient forest officer he was jammu dfo jammu 
I will tell you his name also. And he, uh, Jammu is a city. Uh, it is uh, in, uh, uh, one of the most uh, biggest cities of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. And the land rates there are as high as it can be. So even if one hectare land uh, is very, very valuable. And Sir uh, freed around 500 hectares of land from Jammu, from enforcement. So imagine the kind of pressure, the political pressure that he might have faced. Imagine the kind of non-cooperation from the district admission he might have faced. But he was a very efficient officer. He is. He is a very efficient officer. And how he garnered the support of district administration, we'll discuss in a case study. We'll, we'll uh, keep one session for situational questions also. All these situational questions. That there is a, a tiger has killed a child in a forest, uh, in, a, in a village. Yeah, and the mob has surrounded uh, your vehicle or the DFO office, what will you do? Yeah. There is an encroachment and there is a political pressure, what will you do? You are faced with a bear or an elephant, what will you do? Yeah. So these are some situational questions that we will deal in, in an, another session. Yeah. For now, we keep it to the law. Uh, this is uh, the section that many ask me about. Do we have the power to arrest or the power to arrest without warrant? Yes, you have the power to arrest without warrant. Whom can you arrest? Any person against whom a reasonable suspicion exists. Even if you suspect, uh, even if, if you suspect that someone has committed a crime, a forest crime, you can arrest them without a warrant. Uh, and crime, which of forest offense? Any forest offense which is punishable with imprisonment for one month or upwards. In most of the provisions, they have this provision. So most of the provisions in this act, you can for most of the offenses, you can arrest them without warrant. Every officer making an arrest under this section shall without unnecessarily delay and subject to the provision as to release on bond, take or send a person arrested before the magistrate having jurisdiction in this. So that is the same, all the same. When you arrest someone, all the guidelines of arresting, uh, section uh, article 20 and 22 of the constitution, as well as the DK Basu case guidelines, all of them apply. No handcuffing, uh, in, informing the relatives within 24 hours, uh, as soon as possible, producing before the magistrate uh, within 24 hours. All those things, they are applicable. Okay. Hmm. Some of the offenses are made non bailable also. Like uh, in Madhya Pradesh, this is made as non bailable. So, uh, what is the difference between bailable and non bailable? Anyone? Let's make this session interactive. Whatever you know, even if it is a wrong answer, it is very difficult for me to take online sessions because I used to teach in class. So there Sorry, I yeah. had people who are answering, who are uh, questioning, who are answering, who are responding. So I am not very fond of online sessions because of the lack of interaction, the two-way interaction. Yes, Tejasi. Yeah. Uh, sir, non billable offenses are uh, dangerous offenses. Mm -hmm. which include uh, killing of any of the Schedule 1 animals. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference? What is non-bailable, bailable? bailable? Uh, the basic is, uh, you can, uh, in bailable offense, you can get a bail. Non-bailable, you cannot get a bail. But at what stage? Uh, sir, uh, in normally in CRPC, bailable offenses means at the police station itself, we can get Good. a bail. Good. So when you present uh, a person to a magistrate, he can give bail in any case. Even if it is a heinous crime, he can give bail. But bailable and non-bailable is the power given to the police officers. And in our case, the power given to the forest officers. So whether you can give a bail to a person or not, if you have arrested, can you release them on a bond? That is bailable. So some of the offenses, they are bailable. And some of the offenses, they are non-bailable. So if you have arrested them for that offense, you have to present them to the magistrate. Only the magistrate can give, give bail, you cannot give bail. There is one more section, section 63. Power to prevent commission of offense. Yes. 
for Section 66. So Section 66 says that every forest officer and a police officer shall prevent and may interfere for the purpose of preventing the commission of any forest offense. So this section is also very rarely used by forest officers, but it is, it is an important document that allows you to take steps to prevent the commission of a forest offense. Uh, forest offense. You find a person in a forest area. You find that he is suspicious. He has not committed a crime. He has not hunted or he has not felled a tree. Or some person, uh, there was a case in Maharashtra. Yes, uh, we, we were uh, told this case by uh, a forest officer, uh, our senior. She was a 2012 batch officer. So she told that. Mm, but the example I Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. You are on. I thought someone has a question. Okay. So uh, that was a case where uh, uh, that person uh, to settle a score with the forest officer, the lady forest officer, he was a local influential forest uh, influential leader, and he threatened her that on such and such day there will be a mass encroachment, and we all all of the villagers we will come and we will encroach the forest land. Do whatever you can. And he was a uh, influential forest leader, so there was enough political pressure on the other wings of the uh, administration, the police and revenue, to not cooperate with the forest department. So what can you do in, in such a situation? He has not, uh, can you stop them for, uh, before encroachment? Because he has not yet done the forest uh, offense. They have not yet done. They have just threatened you that we will commit encroachment. So there, there section 66 helps you to prevent commission of offense. So there you can... Uh, citing this section, you can write to the SP of the district that I need such and such force because there is a threat. And every forest officer and police officer, they have to, they can uh, interfere for the purpose of preventing the commission of any forest officer. Let me show you this section also. Okay. Some more clarity. Even if the SP asks you, asks you that no encroachment has been done, why should I provide force? So then you can say that you can provide me force under this section. Police, every police officer shall also prevent and may interfere for the purpose of preventing the commission of any first offense. Okay. Uh, this again is an important section which I forgot to write in the PPT. Yeah. Section 66A. This section can be used against that leader. That leader might inside the villagers to commit encroachment or sell the trees but himself might not have done that still he can be tried under the same offense because abetment also carries the same punishment okay and then yeah this is an important power this is a power to compound offenses this is basically you can uh, any property that you has seized you can release that property on payment of a value as estimated by you. You will estimate that this is the value, pay this and do this. Or any person who has been arrested or any offense has been uh, established against that offense, uh, that person. You can take a sum of money. Obviously, that sum will go to the treasury, not your personal pocket. But you can take that sum of money and then release that person. This is a big power. Not everyone has this power, only the police officer and you as forest officer. You will have this power, power of compounding offenses. No one else. And who can do this? Ranger and above, change forest officer and above. Okay. Any doubts? Keep responding. Any one of you? Uh, no, sir. Yeah. Okay. Is it helpful till now? Should I change mm -hmm. the way? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Some of these provisions will definitely help you in answering questions yeah. regarding forest laws, crimes, and situational questions, basically. Law is the safest answer. You can take recourse to a law. If there is a law, you can safely take recourse to a law and say that, sir, I will uh, do this and this under section this, yeah, according to the powers given under section this and this. It is the safest answer. Never controversy. Okay. 
um sir in case of encroachment uh, we we will actually use this act right you will actually use this this right i mean like uh, to prevent any threat of encroachment as well as whenever encroachment happens yes ha huh. Uh, encroachment. Uh, yeah, I told you that section, uh, section 63, uh, defacing boundary marks or cultivating a land or something. Uh, uh, the punishment is uh, uh, two years, and the fine that is minimum, but the punishment is two years. So encroachment, may you will use that section uh, along with uh, the section. Uh, what section I did tell you? 66. I think. 66. Yes. 66. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hmm. And then presumption. This is again very important. So what, what what do you mean by presumption? Presumption of offense? Anyone? Um, any basis on which an offense may happen? Mm -hmm. OK. So uh, suppose you are asked that there is a truck that is going through your forest naka and you have seized it. And how to prove that? Uh, uh, that uh, that uh, thing, uh, all the timber or all the forest produce, it is not a forest produce. So, how will you prove that it is? On what basis can you arrest him? This is the basis. When in any proceedings taken under this act or in consequence of anything done under this act, a question arises as to whether any forest produce is the property of government. Such produce shall be presumed to be property until the contrary is proved. So the burden of proving is on the accused. He has to prove that the timber that he is carrying or the forest produce that he is carrying or any animal article that he is carrying, it is not from the forest. So this is this again is a big power. And uh, the recent trend uh, with the government, with the current government is to make laws less draconian. So all the uh, all the more uh, heavier powers, they have been uh, removed from the recent amendments, especially through the Jan Vishwas Act 2023. These uh, uh, Indian Forest Act 1927 and the Wildlife Protection Act, these are one of the two of the few acts which have been able to maintain those powers. These powers have not been taken away. Because this is this is very draconian. If you see from a perspective of a third person, how would he prove? And it is uh, if you are uh, doing agroforestry in your land, in your farmland, you have cut the trees. That is eucalyptus. You have cut. You have you have put you have put in a tractor trolley, and you are carrying it to the market, or to some sawmill, or to some furniture wala or some some carpenter. How would you prove that it is from your uh, farm? It is not from a forest, but that burden is on you. You have to prove. Okay. This is to give powers because it is very difficult for the forest officers to prove that this is the same wood, same timber that has been cut from a particular forest area. It has been removed from a particular forest area. So you have to prove. So whenever agroforestry may be, you cut a tree, you get a permit from the local forest uh, department. So you have to show that permit showing that this is the wood. I got this permit and then I cut this. Both from my uh, cut this timber, I fill this timber, and I uh, am carrying these logs from my own farm. Okay. Then uh, section seventy three and seventy nine. These again are uh, less discussed and less used, but important forest provision because they allow you to use the provisions of other acts also. So section 73 says that forest officers are deemed public servants. So then you can use section IPC, where there is a provision where any person who stops a public servant from doing his duty 
can be uh, imprisoned uh, uh, with a can be arrested and imprisonment for uh, imprisoned for six months. So that provision can also be used. This provision can be used in cases of where people have surrounded your vehicle or they are not allowing you to arrest someone. Like uh, many a times uh, in our case, what happens is uh, the man has done a forest offence, killed an animal or felled a tree and carried it to his home. When you go to arrest him. the ladies of the house they will stop the way they will not allow you to arrest them so can you arrest the lady she has not committed an offence no offence has been committed by the person but you can arrest the lady also because they are stopping you from doing your duty so why did you have a lady stop so these are the sections that help you uh, utilize the provisions of other act like cpc crp again section 79 also this enjoins a duty upon the persons who are living in the forest areas they are bound to assist forest officers and police officers this is not just in case of forest offences but in case of forest fires also if there is a fire you will be asked a question there is a forest fire and you are shot on staff how will you tackle the forest fire so there you can say that section 79 it says that persons are bound you will not force them as obviously in interview you will not say that i will force the people here but the people they are bound to assess the forest officers in dousing the fire what you will do instead is you will uh, uh, institute a system of incentive that those people who assess the forest officers their cases of forest rights act or their cases of rights or their privileges they will be allowed to take some forest uh, produce which is uh, which can be legally allowed and which does not destroy the forest some grazing rights grazing permits those people would be given priority those people who help the forest department in dousing fire because it is their duty to assist the forest department under section 79 of iif you can make such policies only under this section section 79 otherwise any any policy which does not have a legal basis is null and void and it can can also be counted under abuse of power or corruption that you are favoring some and not favoring other but here you have a section you have a legal provision okay and hmm. so this is about the penalties and procedures hmm. now there has been a recent amendment to the indian forest act through the jan vishwas act This is the Jan Vishwas Act. I will show you. This is something which is not thought by uh, many, and we, as as aspirants also, it is understandable that we would not be aware of all the amendments to all the acts that has been done. It is very confusing. The first one, the provision was grazing. Now, is it a crime or not? So, this is what they do. Uh, they have done to these acts to make them less draconian. earlier the grazing uh, in a forest area that was also a crime this is the jan vishwas act let me show you can you see the act hello yes, yes sir it is yes sir yes sir so this is the act the jan vishwas amendment of provisions act and it has amended a number of acts and all the all the uh, draconian provisions in these acts have been amended to make the lives of the people easier so there are also uh, in the forest also one of the acts one of our acts has been amended and it is the indian forest act 1927 this and this one cattle grazing this is an ethical issue so suppose in the interview uh, earlier this was a punishable offence this was an offence under section under uh, section 27 of reserved forest i showed you uh, the section 27 can you see this trespass of pastures cattle yes Yeah. so this was again uh, earlier this was also a, a punishable offence uh, 
uh, for a term which may extend to six months. But tell me, can you arrest a person, a poor villager, just for grazing his cattle in the forest? It is not difficult. That person, they are where, where will they graze if there are no pasture lands and all? Where will they do? Especially the tribals and the forest dwellers. What will they do? But you cannot allow it also. So then this provision was decriminalized. Only fine was kept and this imprisonment was removed. Because this was not helpful for forest officers also. Because wherever there is an imprisonment, there is a detailed trial that goes on. So once you, you book a case, then you arrest the person, then you release them on bail bond, then that case goes for prosecution, then conviction happens, and then and the conviction all, almost never happens in these cases. Because the judge will also take a temporary plea for for uh, innocent cases, for bona fide cases. For organized uh, criminals, the court will be strict, but for bona fide cases, the court will also be sympathetic. So it is just a waste of time for the forest department also. You, we don't have a separate prosecution wing. You will have to do this. Your your own subordinates will have to do this. So you have to do protection duties, plantations, everything. And then these convictions also, you have to regularly go to the courts for these small cases. And plus some of these provisions were misused by the forest guards to settle a local scores with, with local people. So this was decriminalized and only fine was kept because we cannot, uh, cannot allow uh, unchecked grazing uh, in the forest. It will destroy the forest. And again, causes any damage by negligence in selling any tree by cutting it. So these two were removed. Yeah. And then this section was uh, inserted, section 1A. And in section 33, this is for protected forest. Again, there also, section 1A. And the penalty is 5,000. So this is the change that has been done through the Jan Vishwas Act. OK? Not, not any major change, but the grazing and all, they have been decriminalized. So that is a positive change for people also and for us also. Uh, for reserved forest, grazing and cattle has been decriminalized. For protected forest, kindling a fire and felling a tree, they have been decriminalized. And they both of these offenses have been made compoundable. So now if a person has grazed the cattle in a forest, and a new regeneration plantation area has been destroyed. You have been given the power of compounding. You can estimate the uh, price of that, uh, that land, that plantation, and then release the person uh, by taking that sum of money. So this is a win-win for both. This is one such picture where forest produce was confiscated and the persons were arrested because they, uh, it was uh, being illegally transported, the timber. So this is what we do, and this is what you will also be doing, hopefully, when you get selected. This is the ranger. These are the deputy rangers. Then they will report it to the DSP. So these are the major provisions of the Indian Forest Act. I hope I have covered many sections. If you have doubts, we'll take it at the end. You just keep writing your doubts. We'll take it at the end. Now, uh, let's come to the Wildlife Protection Act, 1972. Uh, this, again, was an act. It was enacted for the conservation, protection, and management of wildlife. It was enacted in 1972 at around the same time when Stockholm uh, Summit for Environment was conducted. And uh, the then Prime Minister, uh, she was very uh, empathetic to the cause of uh, wildlife. And that is, uh, she enacted this act. And this act was enacted under uh, use, utilizing a provision of constitution. You know that there are three lists, central, state, and concurrent list, and wildlife and forest was in state list at that time. It came to concurrent list through the uh, 70, uh, this 42nd Amendment, 1976, during the emergency. But this act was enacted before that by the central government. How? by utilizing the provision. Uh, I forgot the exact section. It is 249 or 250, I guess, where two or more states, they come together and request the central government to legislate on a state subject. 
So the central government legislated on this subject, wildlife, and then other states simply adopted. Okay. Uh, many of you might might have already known this uh, this fact. Again, the important provisions of Wildlife Pro uh, Protection Act. Again, we'll start from the definitions. What what is an animal? You go sit in an interview, and the first question that you face is, "What is an animal? What will you do? You'll be stumped." Yes, tell me, what is an animal? So there, instead of giving a generic or a laughable answer, what you can do is you can take recourse to the act. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. No, no, I have not said yet. Yeah. This is the definition of an animal. An animal includes amphibians, birds, mammals, and reptiles, and their young, and also include, in the cases of birds and reptiles, their eggs. You see, their young ones, they are also included, and their eggs also. So if you destroy an egg in a forest, again, this is a forest offense. It is akin to killing an animal, hunting an animal. And hunting has the highest punishment in, forest, in the Wildlife Protection Act. Animal article, again, this is simple, any article made from any captive or wild animal. Then this is important. Hunting. So if you are asked, what is hunting? You say killing an animal, killing a wild animal. That is not the exact definition. You are not expected to say verbatim definitions, but you can take recourse. That section 216 of Wildlife Protection Act defines hunting as killing or poisoning of any wild animal or capturing, coursing, snaring, trapping, driving, or baiting also. See, this. This is important. So, uh, yeah, there are many highways uh, that pass through the forest areas. Recently, we were in Bandipur, uh, uh, and before that, uh, we were in Panna. So, in Panna, we saw we regularly traveled uh, from outside of the forest area in the hotel where we were staying to the forest. And many a times we saw that vehicles uh, passing ahead of us, they would throw uh, some food articles, some uh, uh, bananas and all these items to monkeys outside. So if you want, uh, if we wanted, we could have arrested them. We could have stopped those vehicles and we could have arrested them. So this comes under baiting. And this is a very uh, uh, popular technique among the uh, poachers also to capture and kill wild animals. They bait. They'll keep uh, a goat for a leopard to come and then kill the leopard and take away the nails and the canines and the skin. So that is why this has been made a part of hunting. Even if you are baiting, you are hunting. Snaring, trapping, driving. If you are driving a wild animal to a certain location, certain place, you are again, it is hunting. Injuring or destroying or taking any part of the body of any such animal in case of wild birds or reptiles, damaging the eggs of such birds, you are on a beach and you have damaged the eggs of uh, an olive ridley turtle. That again is an hunting. Okay. So you can explain the definition of hunting also. They might ask, they might also ask you that right? people are uh, baiting, people are feeding uh, for animals. What can you do? What are your powers? So this, in, uh, this is included in the definition of hunting and the same provisions that apply to hunting will apply to baiting. Okay. So animal, then hunting, then protected area. So what is a protected area? Again, this might be a st standalone question. What is a protected area according to you? So a protected area according to uh, Section 2 of Wildlife Protection Act means a national park, a sanctuary, a conservation reserve, or a community reserve notified under these disease sections. There are only four protected areas defined under this act. All the other areas, eco-sensitive zone, this and that, and bird conservation area, they are not uh, legally uh, defined protected areas. You are asked, what is a bird sanctuary? Is it a protected area? 
no it is basically a wildlife sanctuary only 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 the name is bird sanctuary it is a wildlife sanctuary all the provisions that apply to a wildlife sanctuary are applicable to a bird sanctuary if it is notified as such what is an eco sensitive zone you know it is not defined under wildlife protection act it is declared under the environment protection act 1 km area buffering all the protected areas has been declared as eco sensitive zone by the supreme court uh, in a recent judgment so that was under uh, environment uh, protection act and that was under the uh, article 142 and 143 of the constitution the supreme court has been given the power to pass any order Let me take a break of ten seconds. Okay. Hmm. And then uh, vermin. This is a this is a very favorite question of interviewers. They they can ask you what is a vermin. And straight away say that it uh, legally it means any wild animal which is notified under section sixty two. and uh, behaviorally it is any animal which has become problematic for the people here yeah, destroying their crops and all these things and plus it is not included in section 1 uh, schedule 1 you cannot declare a tiger as a vermin or an elephant as a vermin elephants regularly come in bandipur in karnataka it is a recurring problem elephants regularly come and destroy uh, uh, crop land but you cannot declare an elephant as a vermin So uh, this is how we will see this vermin section also in detail. Uh, what is a wild animal and what is a wildlife? Again, you will be asked, what is a wild animal? We will say an, an animal who is uh, just roaming the forest. No, it is any animal specified in Schedule One or Schedule Two of the Wildlife Protection Act and found wild in nature. This is the definition of a wild animal. you might be asked a definition what is the difference between wild animal and wildlife again this is defined here wildlife is any animal aquatic or land vegetation which forms part of any habitat so these are few of the definitions uh, zoo yes this definition is also important because it has recently been uh, amended through the recent amendment zoo it is an establishment where stationary or mobile whether stationary or mobile where captive animals are kept for exhibiting to the public or ex situ conservation and includes a circus and off exhibit facilities so a zoo also includes a rescue center and a conservation building center so a zoo generally is open to public but these off exhibit these facilities rescue center and conservation building center they are not open to public here we keep injured animals rescue centers may we uh, bring the rescued animal a uh, and a leopard is uh, has gone to a habitation area and has injured itself So we'll capture it. We'll bring it to the rescue center, treat it, and then uh, release it in the wild. And similarly, there is a conservation breeding center. There is snow leopard conservation breeding center in uh, Darjeeling, uh, West Bengal. So there, they are breeding snow leopards. They have been kept. It is off exhibit, and uh, they are breeding them, and then uh, they will be subsequently released. There is a, a conservation breeding center for red panda also in the same facility in Darjeeling. so this was about the definitions now uh, uh, the initial sections officers and boards so under section 3 uh, the central government appoints a director of wildlife preservation and under section 4 the state government appoints a chief wildlife warden they are ifs officers and the chief wildlife warden is of the rank of pccs the highest rank in the forest department uh, principal chief conservator of forest and he is the highest authority on wildlife matters in a state everything uh, is under he has been designated as the uh, as the authorized officer for wildlife sanctuary national park tiger reserve everything every permission has to come from the wildlife warden is the most important because the overall administration of national parks the yes, central government has been given the power to declare them but the administration is under the state so all the administration is being done by the deputy director and the field director on behalf of the chief wildlife warden then uh, section 5 this is an important section this does not look like it but this will be important when we discuss the more important section this is about the delegation of powers so this chief wildlife warden can delegate his power to his subordinate officer 
and this is how the DFO, the DD and FD of a tiger reserve or a national park and the DFO, they get the power. Because every power in these, this section has been given to Chief Wildlife Warden. Yeah, but Chief Wildlife Warden of the state cannot perform all the functions for all the protected areas. So he has to delegate a few powers. So all the power under this section can be de uh, delegated except one, which I will tell you in the next section. Section 5A talks about the National Board for Wildlife. You must have, all of you must have studied about NBWL. The chairman is the uh, Honorable Prime Minister and the Forest Minister is the member. And to alter the boundaries of any protected areas, you need the approval of the National Board for Wildlife. Again, Section 6, State Board of Wildlife has been created, not very significant. Yes, this is the most significant section of this act, hunting of wild animals. So hunting, mein, there are three sections. Uh, the first one is section 9. It is a basic section which says that hunting is prohibited. Nothing else. So this makes hunting a crime. Hunting is prohibited under this act. And then there are two important sections which uh, tell you how uh, a few cases where the animals can be captured and hunted. So the first one is section 11, hunting of wild animals to be permitted in certain cases. So when can you hunt an animal? No person shall hunt any wild animal except section 11. When can you hunt uh, a wild animal? If the chief wildlife warden may, if he is satisfied that any wild animal specified in Schedule 1 has become dangerous to human life or is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery, only in this case the animal can be hunted. It has become dangerous like the tigress Avni. You might, all of you might have seen the documentaries, all of you might have seen the movie Avni. Uh, movie Sherni, which is based on the tigress Avni. She had become dangerous to human life. There are many controversies. I know you might have also studied it, but let's not go into those controversies. It is, yeah, let's, let's keep ourselves to the uh, law only. So whenever the, any animal becomes dangerous to human life or it is disabled or diseased beyond recovery, they can be hunted. Conditions, first is order in writing. And second is that order should be from chief wildlife warden. Now there is another section, uh, Chief, uh, uh, okay, before that, uh, before you hunt, before you kill that animal, provide it, uh, one more condition, provide that no wild animal shall be ordered to be killed unless the Chief Wildlife Warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be captured, tranquilized and translocated. So before you decide to hunt it, you have to do this. So hunting is again not, uh, not easy. The Chief Wildlife Warden will not give uh, straight away an order. A tiger gown a tiger trade in a village, and chief wildlife warden will raid. Okay, hunt him, kill him. No, it has to be captured, it has to be tranquilized, translocated, and released in the forest area. Only in the last resort should it be killed. And even when it is captured, again, provided further that no such captured animal shall be kept in captivity unless the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be rehabilitated in the wild. And for the reasons for the same shall be recorded in writing. So you have to capture it, you have to tranquilize it, you have to capture it, and then you have to release it in the wild. This is the first course of action and the most normal course of action. If it cannot be released in the wild for reasons to be recorded in writing, like it has, it is injured, it has no canines. So if you release it in wild, it will die. It will be killed by other animals. If there is a tiger, it has no canines, it cannot hunt, it will die. Or it will again come to the habitation areas because it has no canines. Canines are very important for hunting. It has no nails. So you cannot hunt. So what it will do, it will look for easy prey. And what are the easy prey? Livestock which is tied uh, outside a house. Or a person who has gone in the morning to the forest to graze his cattle or to relieve himself or herself. These are the easy prey. So this will again create a conflict situation. Then you can keep that animal in captivity send him to a zoo or a rescue center anywhere with permission from the chief wildlife. Otherwise, you have to release that animal in the wild. If 
that animal cannot be kept or tranquilized and located and in the, uh, for the last resort you can order it can be ordered to be killed but only by the chief wildlife warden and order in right okay then uh, section 11 uh, b so clause b says chief wildlife warden or the authorized observer may if he is satisfied that any wild animal specified in schedule 2 has become dangerous to human life again same provision the only difference is schedule 1 and here the difference is schedule 2 so if it is a schedule 1 animal only the chief wildlife warden can give the order in right but if it is a schedule 2 animal chief wildlife warden or his authorized officer can give the order in right if it is destroying crops or disease beyond recovery whatever it is the authorized officer and who is the authorized officer I told you the power of delegation. To whoever the chief wildlife warden has delegated that power to, that person can also give an order in right. This is what creates a difference between the Schedule One and Schedule Two. We say that Schedule One animals enjoy a higher degree of protection. Schedule Two animals declare uh, deserve uh, and they enjoy a lesser degree of protection. But where is that section? This is the section. 11A Schedule One, 11B Schedule Two. Okay. to kill or to capture a scheduled one animal you need the permission of chief wildlife warden who sits in the headquarters of a state so for rajasthan he will be sitting in jaipur for mp he will be sitting in bhopal so you have to get the order in writing from him for scheduled two animals any officer who is authorized on his behalf can give that order fine then comes section 12 are you all following whatever i am uh, telling yes sir Yes, sir. Is it helpful? Yes, sir. Okay. Hmm. So, yes. Hmm. Then section twelve. This again is an exception to the hunting uh, provision, and this is regarding grant of permit for special purposes. So the chief wildlife warden again here. Chief wildlife warden will give grant that permit. And for only these purposes, first is education, second is scientific research, third is scientific management. So when you say that you as a DFO, the, you must have read news articles about translocation of wild animals, like uh, tiger is translocated from uh, Ranthambore to Mukundra Hill, or from Panna to uh, from uh, Pinch to Panna. When uh, in 2009. Panna and Saris Kaval two tiger reserves where tiger population became zero due to excessive poaching and lack of uh, monitoring. So it completely became zero. So then the government, uh, the alarm bells started ringing and tigers were brought from other areas and then they were reintroduced into these two tiger reserves, Panna and Saris Kaval. Although both have a different success story, Saris Kaval has not uh, been very successful, but Panna has been. But how do you do it? If you catch, capture it, there is no distinction. Yeah, the forest officer can do this. Forest officer can do that. No, no animal shall be hunted. And hunting may capturing also comes. Prohibition may you saw. Hunting means capturing, baiting, snaring, anything. So even if a forest officer does this, you are violating this provision. But where have you been given this uh, uh, this ex exception? It is in scientific management. the translocation of any wild animals population management of wildlife if you have too many cheetahs they will eat away the forest too less of uh, predators and too many cheetahs they they will eat away the forest what you do you manage the population you can't locate some of them to other forest areas for recognize zoos for sending uh, how do uh, from where do these animals come i told you so an animal is uh, injured beyond repair It will not be released to the forest area. Where should it be sent? To zoos. Under what provision? And for museums and similar. Uh, for collection of specimens. If you want to collect a specimen for zoo, for museum, similar institution. And uh, one more important provision is derivation, collection, or uh, and preparation of snake venom for manufacturing uh, manufacturing of life saving drugs. 
define snakes in forest areas most of the snakes are found in forest areas how do you manufacture snake venom through this what is the process of uh, manufacturing a snake venom i'm diverting a bit but important any one of you know how do you manufacture anti venom okay. sir by injecting a small amount of uh, venom uh, generally uh, earlier they used to use horses mm. but uh, they don't use now good now they use genetic engineering and all okay. thank you sir yeah. okay good earlier they used to use horses so they will inject that venom and then the horse will produce antibodies and those antibodies would be collected that was a crude method Promoted by Wildlife Protection Act. Okay. Cool. So let's go back to the presentation. Yes. So these are the special purposes where permit can be granted. Again, brand, uh, permit for hunting is never granted in in practice. Yeah, it is never granted. The only permit granted is you do you go. all this these institutes wildlife institute of india forest research institute all the all the msc and phd student they are granted permit in protected areas and uh, conduct research on wildlife under these under this section section 12 so when you are a dfo you will also get some request and uh, in the interview also you might get such a question that a, a, a research scholar comes to you and says that i want to conduct the research what will you do will you allow it? i want to conduct a research in a core area of a tiger reserve will you allow me? so this is under your power this is under the power of uh, chief wildlife warden too not the df yes but this can be delegated except section ha uh, yes I, i forgot to tell you except section 11 i told you no uh, uh, all the other powers can be delegated by the chief wildlife warden to others only section 11 sub clause a this cannot be delegated this this chief wildlife warden has to exercise himself next comes protected areas wildlife sanctuaries national parks conservation reserves and community reserves so wildlife sanctuaries we have five important sections first one is section 18 here the state government remember the state government uh, comes out with a notification declaring its intention that such and such area is to be declared as a wildlife sanctuary and uh, after the uh, settlement of rights it comes with a final notification there are two notification every year first notification is for the intention second notification is final declaration that is how you would be confused in in a few states there are confusion ki how many national parks are there uh, particularly in rajasthan there is a desert national park but it is national park only in the name actually it is a wildlife sanctuary because it was earlier declared as a wildlife sanctuary and then in national park also you have to follow the same procedure first you uh, come out with a notification declaring intention and then the second notification is final so for desert national park the intention the first notification was uh, issued but the second notification final notification was never issued so it is still technically not a national park it is a wildlife sanctuary once it becomes a national park there are some differences which we will see what are they sanctuary may there are a few things which are allowed but national parks may uh, we we see uh, that that famous cliche answer that what is the difference between uh, wildlife sanctuary and national park wildlife sanctuary may everything is allowed unless uh, prohibited and national park may everything is prohibited unless allowed we will see how exact provisions so section 18 may you declare it and as soon as you declare section 27 applies and this is Uh, a section which restricts the entry of any person in a sanctuary except forest officer or person who has a valid business in the sanctuary the others they cannot entry without permit and then section 28 talks about the permits how how will you stop a person from a sanctuary this section allows you to stop but how is this safari tourism and all this conducted this tourism has a legal basis in section 28 all the safaris that you conduct in wildlife sanctuaries and national parks it has a legal basis in section 28 so in in this section the chief wildlife warden again the power has been given to chief wildlife warden but he can delegate to the field director and it is delegated in most cases investigation or study of wild animals photography or film making 
scientific research all the net geo films they are made in forest areas they are made under permit under this section then scientific research that the wildlife institute of india it is uh, doing commendable research in, in the area of wildlife again through permit and this tourism safari tourism again through this then section 29 this is an important section so i'll take you to the So this is the section that you can see declaration of a sanctuary, state government may by notification, then again proclamation by collector, appointment of collector, he shall see the nature, the existence, nature and extent of rice, and then determine the rights. Sanctuary may you can keep having some rights. This is the section. In case of a claim to a right in or over any land is the uh, is uh, is there. the collector shall pass an order admitting or rejecting the same so this is the difference between national park and wildlife sanctuary wildlife sanctuary may you can admit a claim a right and that right can be enjoyed by a few people even after declaration of a sanctuary but this is not the case in wildlife uh, national park this section allow in consultation with chief wildlife for them the continuation of any right of any person in or over any land within the limits of The collector has to consult the chief wildlife warden, and then it can be allowed the continuation of it. This provision does not apply to national parks, and this is the major difference, the biggest difference between wildlife sanctuary and national park. So compare yourself to a candidate who will say that cliche answer: national park may everything prohibited unless allowed, wildlife sanctuary everything allowed unless. And when you are asked the same question, what is the difference? You say this. That's section twenty-four, section C. Uh, subsection C does not apply to national parks, so there is no continuation of enjoyment of rights in national parks, but it can be the case in wildlife sanctuary. Rights is basically pasture uh, grazing rights or rights collecting water from the pond, something like or any rights uh, in the forest area. Passing through the forest, you can stop a person from entry in the sanctuary also. But if there is a sacred grove or a temple in the forest, what will you do? So that right can be continued. Then these are the proceedings. They are not important. Declaration of area, restriction of sanctuary. I told you, no person shall enter except these: public servant, chief wildlife warden, any person who has immovable property inside, or a person passing through sanctuary along a public highway, and all. So these person can enter. again anyone who is residing in a sanctuary he has some duties he has to prevent the commission of offense he has to extinguish any fire he has to assist the forest officers in preventing of commission of any offense and again no person shall cause a damage to boundary mark this again i told you grant of permit and this is destruction this is the punishment no person shall destroy exploit or remove any wildlife including forest produce from a sanctuary both of these has been defined wildlife is defined and forest produce forest produce definition is same as uh, indian forest act 1926 so no forest produce can be taken away this is the difference between a reserved forest and a protected area protected area is wildlife sanctuary national park and conservation and community reserves so reserved forest mein you can fell a tree a tree as a as a forest officer i'm telling about the department yeah. so uh, you can fell a tree you can sell it will will we are not talking about the goda varman judgment and the ban on green felling we are talking before that now you cannot do green fell unless it is approved by supreme court and central government through a valid working plan but before that you know uh, apart from that yeah. in a reserved forest you could harvest the yeah, forest produce but in a national park and wildlife sanctuary you cannot harvest uh, this uh, forest produce wildlife can anyway shall not be destroyed but forest produce can also not be harvested so this presents a problem uh, we got an interesting case study in tamil nadu recently we were in anamalai uh, tiger reserve and there is a problem of senna spectabilis it is a uh, dangerous invasive plant which has been widespread 
in the southern areas particularly, especially in the Nilgiri Vaisya Reserve, Bandipur, uh, Annamalai, and all these areas. And it is rapidly spreading and it is very, very fast growing. And it is replacing all the native trees. But the forest officers there are facing uh, uh, this particular challenge that they can cut that Sana Spectabilis, but they cannot sell it. So it is basically only cost, no revenue. And that cost is a prohibiting factor because it has it has spread very, very wide. So you, uh, it entails huge cost to remove all the Sana Spectabilis plant trees. But cost is a factor. Funding is always a challenge in government departments. So you cannot do that. If you were allowed to sell that tree, yeah, that tree, the bark, uh, the, the wood from that tree is utilized in paper and pulp industry. So if you were allowed to do that, it would have been easy. The forest officers would have been able to tackle it much before. So this, this again is an answer to the question. Uh, if they say that why have we not been able to control the spread of invasives in protected area, this is one of the reasons. Because you have no revenue. So uh, all that is remains is cost. And cost is a prohibiting factor because funds are, uh, are not always available. So what they have, they have uh, devised uh, an ingenious uh, this way out to control this Senai Spectabilis. What they do is they have asked this paper mills, Tamil Nadu paper, you know, the TNPL and ITC and other paper mills. They have asked them that you come, you destroy it, uh, you cut the Senna and you take it. We cannot sell it to you, yeah, but we cannot cut because we are uh, having funding crunch. So you cut and you take it away yeah, without uh, destroying the habitat, without destroying any other tree and any region. Dish. You cut it and you take it away. We will give you a permit. You cut and take it away. We cannot sell it. You cannot sell even a blade of grass. You cannot earn anything from the forest produce in a protected area. except uh, uh, under a permit granted by Chief Wildlife Warden. And no such permit shall be granted unless state government being satisfied with National Board of Wildlife. National Board is the NBWS. So you cannot even um, uh, alter the boundaries of this sanctuary. Yes. Provided that where the forest produce is removed from sanctuary, the same may be used for meeting the personal bona fide. Even if you give a permit, this should not be commercial. If it is a protected area, it should not be commercial. It should be bona fide. From the reserve forest areas, you do commercial harvesting. Like in central Indian states, Tendupata harvesting is being done. People have been given rights. The people are collecting, then giving to forest departments. And then that is being sold. They are being paid. But this cannot be done in a protected area. You cannot do that in Satpura National Park. You can do that in a, in a territorial forest but not a protected forest. Causing fire, yes, this again is a pro, uh, uh, an offense, causing fire in the sanctuary, entry into sanctuary with a weapon, control of sanctuary, immunization, okay. Yes, this. Hmm. The chief wildlife warden has been given some power. These are general powers. He can construct roads, bridges, building, fence, all the forest officers and all, and he can take measures. This is important. He can regulate, control, or prohibit grazing. So in a wildlife sanctuary, he can regulate grazing. So this shows that grazing can be permitted in a wildlife sanctuary by chief wildlife warden. But this provision, again, is not applicable to national park. So on a national park, all other provisions are applicable except Section uh, 33, subsection D, and section 24, subsection C. Otherwise, a national park and a wildlife sanctuary is exactly the same. But due to these sections, they are very different. The degree of protection, the enjoyment of rights by people, this is what is the difference between. National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary. Section 35 may state government declares National Park. Section 35 may he it is written that all sections from 18 to 33 are applicable except Section 24D, right, and Section 33D, 
fine the technical difference between wildlife sanctuary and a national park are you all with me yes sir listening or clear listening sir okay uh, so we'll quickly finish it in a few more slides Hmm. Ah, then the two remaining protected areas, conservation reserves and community reserves. The basics are uh, asked in an interview. They will just ask what is a con conservation reserve and what is a community reserve. Or at max, they might ask the difference between the two. So the definition will help you answer that question. Any area owned by government, particularly the areas adjacent to national parks and sanctuaries, and those areas which link one protected area with another, can be declared as conservation reserve. So if there is an area which you do not want to declare as a wildlife sanctuary and national park because if you want to declare an area as a wildlife sanctuary and national park you have to do all the proceedings from section 18 to 27 18 to 26 settlement of rights yeah, you do not want to do that so you declare a conservation reserve people will also be living but it will enjoy uh, some degree of protection and similar is the case with community reserve but it is a private land then comes section 38 all these powers all the four areas which can be declared by state government under section 38 the central government can also declare these areas as wildlife sanctuary national park conservation reserve and community reserve fine is it section 38 me same powers have been given to the central government then comes uh, this chapter a chapter on zoo so uh, you might as well be asked what is the legal basis for zoo so then you need to know that zoos uh, the legal basis for zoos is in wildlife protection act this chapter defines what are zoos uh, the definition we have already seen see this chapter says establishes the first section of this chapter uh, section 38a it establishes central zoo authority these are so there are uh, member member secretary and all those are factual details you can see from the act itself and the powers of uh, czda also it is factual detail you can see from the act or just google it you will find uh, the powers of czda basically it has the power to regulate uh, recognize the zoos zoos has have to be recognized even if they are government and then they can recognize they can be recognized and then all the transfer yeah, the zoo master plan has to be approved by czda all the transfer of animals between zoos and among the zoos has to be done uh, after uh, taking approval from czd so these are some of the powers of czd section 38j is important so yeah, this again is a situational question you are a manager of a zoo yeah, you are uh, the director of a zoo and you see there are some tourists who are teasing some animals feeding them and teasing some animals what can you do so now you have seen but uh, uh, if you were asked directly in the interview can you uh, what can you do what are the provisions So that provision again is given in this act there is a punishment we will see what it is but you cannot tease an animal in zoo again ntca the next chapter is about ntca so ntca again is a statutory authority because it is uh, given a legal basis under this act section 38l it describes ntca and its powers and uh, section 38v this section is important because this talks about the tiger conservation plan so uh, do you know uh, the difference between working plan management plan tiger conservation plan any one of you okay i'll tell you. so working plan is a written document for 10 years and it uh, outlines the steps all the things that has to be done in a territorial forest area any reserved forest which was declared under 1927 ifa 1927 for that for those areas there is a working plan for protected areas under wildlife protection act there is a management plan so you have to make a separate management plan for protected areas whether it be national park whether it be wildlife sanctuary whether it be tiger reserve and then if the area is also declared a tiger reserve which is declared by ntc then you have to formulate another plan that is tcp 
tiger conservation plan this plan will be approved by ntc working plan it, it goes through the state government to central government it is approved by the central government this management plan is approved again goes to the central government and this is approved by the national board for wildlife and then tiger conservation plan it is approved by the ntc and you cannot change the area of a tiger reserve without the approval of ntc ntc has been given all the powers with respect to tiger reserves and it is a very powerful body here when you come into the service you will see ntc when a tiger dies if a tiger is killed it would be a nightmare for a forest officer the ntca takes these cases very seriously and it has been given very elaborate powers and ntc has released guidelines on tiger death on tackling human uh, tiger uh, conflict issue all these things so there are detailed guidelines that you have to follow them and any step that you do not follow uh, that can become a, a, a problem for your career so ntca uh, uh, is a powerful body in that respect. Yes, and in this very section, tiger conservation plan is a detailed plan that what are you going to do about this thing. In this section, 38B, two important things are discussed. One is what uh, uh, what gives protection to a tiger reserve. National park, may we saw there is section 35. Wildlife sanctuary, may we saw there is section 26, 27, 29, 30. What gives protection to tiger reserve? So in this, there is a clause added that provisions of subsection, subsection 2 of section 18, these uh, section uh, sections uh, of section 27, section 30, 32, and clauses B and C of section 33 of this act shall as far as may be applied in relation to tiger reserve as they apply in relation to sanctuary. So this thing makes it protected. This section. Again, you will see that section 30 is uh, not uh, included here. Section 30 is that uh, fire wala and all. And B, C of 33. Section A of 33 is not included. You can go back and see those sections. They are the milder things. So they are not included. So that Tiger Reserve enjoys highest level of protection. So higher in terms of protection, Tiger Reserve is the highest, the national park, and then wildlife sanctuary. So all the uh, clauses, all these clauses are applicable to Tiger Reserve. And then Another thing which is defined in this section is the core and buffer. You, you might have been hearing, you keep hearing about the Tiger Reserve ka core. You cannot do this in core, you cannot do that in core. What is core, what is buffer? So where is it defined? It is defined here. Core or critical tiger habitat. It is, uh, uh, there is a detailed definition is given. And then buffer or the peripheral area of core, it is designated as the buffer. And uh, the provisions are same, core and buffer. No? All these provisions apply. If it is a tiger reserve, highest level of protection. Then there is an, uh, a body called Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. Section 38Y defines, uh, establishes uh, that body and gives powers. So it is basically a central government agency. Uh, if there is any wildlife crime, who investigates it? The state forest department, you as forest officer you and your subordinate staff will be uh, investigating those. But the wildlife crimes, they are not just, uh, you know, they are not just a phenomenon of a state. Sometimes they, it, is, it is part of an organized crime. We were surprised. We had a module on uh, wildlife crime detection exercise and we had uh, uh, very able officers from Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. And we were surprised to hear that one rhino horn can get you around 40 to 50 AK-47. So imagine the stakes that go into illegal wildlife trade. If there is a, a, an uh, insurgent organization of, uh, say, Northeast, Assam, Ulfa, or whatever it is, see, they need weapons for their insurgent activities. And where can they get weapons? See, they don't. If they don't have money, which is not easy, see, money laundering and all those uh, laws have made it difficult. So what is the easiest for them to poach uh, an innocent wild animal? So they poach, and that is why the rhino poaching has been given highest level of attention. In Assam, you, uh, the forest officers, the guards have been given the power to shoot at sight in the forest area. And they have been given AK-47. And they are thousands. The field director of Assam, 
uh, of Kaziranga Forest, uh, Kaziranga Tiger Reserve. He commands a force of thousand armed men with AK-47. It is equivalent to a battalion. A colonel a battalion has thousand armed men, and it is headed by a colonel. So the director of Kaziranga, you as IFS officer, you will be equivalent to a colonel. Although the domain is different, but it is as ferocious as as um, because the poachers there they belong to the organized insurgent group and they don't hesitate before shooting, and that is why the forest officers have rightly been given the power to shoot. Okay, so uh, this uh, okay. So I was telling about this uh, interstate ring and international rings. So to tackle this interstate and international rings, so there is a poacher. He commits a crime in Madhya Pradesh and then runs away to Chhattisgarh. What will you do if the Chhattisgarh police or forest of, uh, uh, office do not cooperate? Uh, they will cooperate, but there are some coordination issues. So WCCB is the agency that has been given some powers under this action, uh, under this act, to deal with these issues. Okay. Uh, then the next chapter. Uh, this is a new chapter which is added uh, through the recent amendment. Uh, amendment uh, 2022 uh, 2023 and this include this has included the uh, provisions of CITES CITES is the international convention in trade in endangered species convention on international trade in, uh, in endangered species so all the provisions of CITES they have been included in this act now earlier there was a criticism of wildlife protection act the CITES provisions are not uh, included but now they have been there is a management authority and scientific authority. They have also been established and a new schedule has been added. So this is the major change that has been done through this amendment. And one more change has been done. Uh, you, most of you would be aware that the schedules have been rationalized. Earlier, there were six schedules, four schedules of animals, viewed animals there with varying degree of protection. Then fifth schedule uh, of vermins and uh, fourth schedule was of plant, three schedules of animals. Then fifth schedule was of vermin and sixth schedule was about, uh, sorry, uh, sixth schedule was about uh, plant and fifth was about vermin, uh, something like that. Now they have rationalized it. Uh, schedule one for animals enjoying highest degree of protection. Schedule two, lower degree of protection. Schedule three, plants. And schedule four, cytus, cytus animals. All the animals which are declared uh, included in the appendices of cytus they are included in Schedule 4 and they enjoy protection. This again is a major uh, uh, amendment. This can also be asked in an interview that the recent Wildlife Protection Act, what were the major amendments? So one is the rationalization of schedules and the second one is inclusion of cycle program. Now comes the important part, offenses and penalties. Uh, the first and the most important section is Section 50. This uh, section 50, again, I will take you to the act itself so that it would be easy for you to make sense of what I am saying. Other provisions are regarding the transport of animals and all. So we don't have to go in so much detail. This is Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. This is Trade or Commerce in Wild Animals. There are the prohibited and uh, has highest punishment. This chapter has highest punishment. Prohibition of trade or commerce in trophies, animal articles derived from certain animals. This is for poachers and organizations. This is CITES. This chapter has been added. Offenses. So the first offense is, uh, the first provision is power of entry, search, arrest and detention. So this power has been given to any forest officer. This power has been given to others also. But others, there is a condition of rank. If it is a police officer, he has to be a rank of sub-inspector and above. Or a customs officer or a coast guard. He has to be a rank of assistant commandant and above. But for forest officers, anyone, even your forest guard, has the power to entry, search, arrest, and detention. Hmm. So, 
So what are the powers? First is require any such person to produce for inspection. So you can ask any person to produce before you for inspection, any captive animal, animal article, whatever he is keeping in your uh, in his house, any any animal article, antler horns or some tiger canine. Yeah. You can ask him to produce before you. If not, all right. Stop any vehicle. You can stop a vehicle in order to conduct search or inquiry or enter upon or search any premises, land, vehicle, or vessel in occupation of such person. If you have a suspicion, you can stop any vehicle. There is no nothing uh, is written about the place that it should be in forest area or something. If you have a suspicion, you can do it. And seize any captive animal. If you see any captive animal, you see a tortoise in, in, a, in, a, in someone's house, you can seize. Any captive animal, wild animal, animal article, meat, trophy, whatever. If you see someone, some people who are nearby forest areas cooking meat, you can see that meat just to ascertain that it is not uh, of a wild animal. A wild animal has not been killed. And then you can uh, seize uh, these tools also. Trap tool, vehicle, vessel, weapon all. This was done uh, with Salman Khan in Jodhpur. The meat was seized, his gypsy was seized. Everything was seized and he was uh, charged with uh, offense under this act. He was arrested. And unless he is satisfied that such person, huh? So if you are satisfied that such person will appear and answer to any charge that may be preferred against you, you can arrest him without warrant and detain him. So if you are faced with uh, uh, this question, like, can you arrest or under what sections Salman Khan was arrested? This is the section. Or can you arrest a person? Yes, you can. If you are satisfied that that person will appear, then you can leave him. If you are not, then you arrest him. Poachers are arrested under this. You can detain a person. You can. Uh, once you arrest him, you have to take them to magistrate for remand. Yes, this provision. Notwithstanding anything contained in any other law, any person who is uh, any forest officer is not below the rank of this assistant director either or assistant conservator of forest, which you will become once you get selected to IFS. Your first posting would be as assistant conservator of forest. So an ACF has the power to issue a search warrant. You need not go to a court to get a search warrant. You can enforce the attendance of witness. You can ask anyone to come and uh, be a witness. You can compel the discovery and production of documents and material objects, and you can record evidence, and you can take a uh, statement of the accused. That also. Okay. And then penalties. For penalties, let's go to this because I have made it simple there in organization. Section 51, it describes about the penalties. So if you violate any section of this act, the punishment is imprisonment of three years and one lakh rupees. You can be jailed for three years. The final punishment is after conviction, it is three years. If you do that offense again, subsequent offense, the punishment becomes seven years and one lakh rupees. And you know that any offense that carries a punishment of seven years or more is a heinous offense. So repeated wildlife crime is a heinous offense. This is for poachers and the organized crime gang. And then uh, these two exceptions, chapter 5A and uh, section 38J. Chapter 5A, I told you it is about dealing in animal articles, so all the dealers of animal articles. Nowadays, uh, the wildlife, uh, illegal wildlife trade has assumed proportion of billions of dollars. And it is being done through WhatsApp, Telegram, dark web also. People are, we were shown in our training, we were shown images of people, of exotic animals being uh, smuggled through flights, through, through many, many ways. And people are now fond of uh, keeping uh, exotic wildlife animals as pets. 
so that again is punishable and that is punishable to the highest amount seven years straight away seven years and 25000 rupees and this section 38j is about the teasing of animals in zoos that is for six month and 2000 so if you find someone in a zoo uh, teasing an animal you can arrest them and keep them for six months practically we don't do it like people will always do uh, some sort of things but if it is something which endangers the life of an animal we will definitely get it to them then there is section 51b it says that all these uh, 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 provisions are cognizable and non bailable certain provisions what is cognizable someone can tell me what is a cognizable offense yes please you have raised a hand uh, yes. sir uh, yes. uh, i had a question regarding wildlife protection act sir. okay okay yeah question regarding uh, wildlife protection act sir yes. under which section is the trading between kerala forest department uh, and other paramilitary forces was done sir like, under which section uh, under which section mm -hmm. was the trading of ivory between kerala forest department mm -hmm. and uh, other paramilitary forces recently uh, indo itbp asked uh, kerala forest department for ivory for display okay. purpose and it rejected it but earlier it had given for other uh, uh, paramilitary forces mm -hmm. okay okay there are a few sections uh, if you see uh, let me share it So there is this trading of animal articles. About this. Uh, the chief wildlife warden, he has been given the power to issue permits or licenses for trading of these things. Prohibition of dealing in this, subject to other provisions. Declaration by dealers. So all the dealers who have these things, they have to declare it. So the chief wildlife warden has been given the power to issue permits. Issued a certificate of ownership. Transfer such item to any person or transfers or transport, transports from state. Certificate of ownership under. So these are a few provisions which allowed earlier, which allowed these things to happen. But purchase of captive animal by a person other than a licensee. Other persons cannot purchase, but a licensee can. Captive animal or animal articles, any animal article. They can be purchased. So there are some provisions, but in practice, let me tell you, these provisions are never used. No, uh, earlier it was used to be given, but since uh, now the awareness has raised. People are aware, there are NGOs, even the forest officers, they are not inclined to give these kind of permits. So as you said that earlier it was given, they, they were given to a few uh, paramilitary forces, but now it would not be given. Uh, if I heard you correctly, it has been refused, right? Nagbhushan? Hello? I think we... Yes, sir. Got it, sir. Got it. Yeah. You got it, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, yes. now, uh, 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 if I heard you correctly, it has been refused, right? The request has been refused. Yes, sir. Uh, the Kerala Forest Government has been uh, has there refused. There are provisions where Chief Wildlife Warden can allow, but in practice, nowadays, no such request is entertained. The only requests which are entertained are these, these requests, yeah, these things. Uh, this. Declaration of dealer. So you would be knowing that there are a few people uh, earlier, there were hunters, uh, especially people belonging to the ruling classes. So they were hunters and they had animal articles. So those people who had animal articles before uh, the uh, commencement of this act, okay. they had to declare it within 30 days. So if they declare it, they would be given an ownership certificate. And then they can keep those items with them. So you would have seen these articles in someone's home. If some of you, as, as any one of you has seen, I don't know if anyone of you has seen. Uh, 
some some hotels or some rajwadas or some some people who from the ruling classes they had these animal articles so they keep them they display them in their houses in their drawing rooms it is basically a trophy for them so they do this only if they have ownership certificate otherwise you can straight away seize them i'll tell you an important uh, an interesting uh, uh, thing that happened to us we were in west bengal we were visiting the jallavara national park and we met the deputy director uh, deepak sir a very dynamic and very brave officer so uh, uh, he told us uh, about yes uh, so we were visiting a tea factory okay uh, sorry this was in darjeeling uh, and uh, this was told by darjeeling dfo hari krishnan sir he is again again a very dynamic officer so we were visiting the next day we were visiting a tea garden a tea estate tea factory So he was telling about the tea factory that this same tea factory was raided by me. The DFO told us yes, sir, that it was raided by me because they had some animal articles, and those were historical animal articles they had from uh, from the past. But they did not have ownership certificates because they did not know about this provision and they did not declare it. So I seized all of them, and they run into crores. Their value run into crores because the supply has stopped. Now you cannot do this. now all the ivory that the department seizes is burned you might have come across news reports that assam forest department burned um, 500 tons of ivory recently so everything is burned nobody is given anything so uh, now their rates is in crores so that was seized by the dfo and that very same factory was being visited by us so we saw the behavior of the tea factory that uh, owner of the tea factory he was very submissive because he, yeah, he had been shown the power so that he did not have valid certificates so this was interesting to see first time uh, i hope you have got your answer i diverted a bit yes sir uh, yes sir got it okay. sir uh yes so this is chapter 5a trading in animal article 7 years teasing in a zoo 6 months cognizable and non bannable yes i was asking this what is a cognizable offense Any one of you can tell. No. Uh, uh, sir, uh, yes. sir, sir, sir. Sir, I'm not sure, but uh, I'll give it a try. Yes. I feel a cognizable offense is an offense which is done intentionally. Okay. And uh, the non, no, non cognizable offense uh, may be an offense. Uh, done uh, by an ignorance uh, or by okay, by chance. Okay, right answer. Yes, Kavya. Uh, cognizable offenses are offenses which can be uh, uh, we, uh, one can arrest without a warrant. Yes, yes. So cognizable is you can take cognizance as an officer. You can take cognizance of those offenses. You do not need the permission of the magistrate. Permission basically is warrant. So you do not need a warrant from the magistrate to arrest a person. so many of the uh, uh, crimes in uh, uh, offenses and under this act have been made as cognizable offenses most of it and then again section 52 talks about abetment it carries the same punishment so if you abet your friend to do hunting or uh, to tease an animal or whatever it is it carries the same punishment again section 54 the power of compounding this is a special power given to you apart from the police officers and the judiciary no no you can there are a few uh, crimes in this act there are very few crimes that can be compounded not all but there are a few crimes that can be compounded you can take a sum of money from that person and you can release that person if you have seized a vehicle you can take a sum of money and then release that vehicle also. section 57 same presumption in this case it is clearly written that the presumption lies on the accused Uh, let me show you section 57 yeah. presumption where in any prosecution for offense against the act it is established that the person is in possession custody or control of any wild animal captive animal or any animal article 
it shall be presumed until the contrary is proved the burden of proving which shall lie on the accused that such person is in unlawful position so it is presumed guilty he has to prove that that animal article or wild animal is lawfully in his possession in his lawful position okay and then seizure of property is yes, this again is an interesting section you can see the property also of a person prohibition of holding illegally acquired property so any property that has been held through the proceeds of crime under this act that you get crores of rupees by selling in rhino horn and you purchase a house that house can be confiscated identifying illegally acquired property and seizure or seizing of illegally acquired point then the last one is government section 62 so earlier there was a separate section for government now uh, uh, section say, uh, schedule 6 uh, separate schedule for government all the governments the list of governments was declared there all the, there were only three or four yeah, but it was in that now that schedule has been removed and it is only this section that allow uh, empowers the central government not the state government mind you the central government may by notification declare any wild animal specified in schedule 2 remember not in schedule 1 schedule 1 animal cannot be declared as vermin elephant tiger you cannot declare them as vermin even if their population exceeds so central government can declare them to be vermin for any area you can declare it for a specific area and for such duration so the area and period has to be specified in that notification and such wild animals shall be deemed not to be included in schedule 2 basically it can be hunted so it is uh, the rats the nil gai the blue bull they are they uh, breed rapidly and then they cause damage to the farmers wild boar they also breed uh, excessively and they damage the fields the crop fields so they can be declared as vermin by sent uh, by central government and yes uh, this i forgot to include in uh, that presentation this again is a new section added by the recent amendment this is also a major amendment there were no provisions of invasive alien species earlier no by the uh, wildlife protection act amendment uh, recent amendment so these are the things one is rationalization of schedule cites provisions vermin uh, provision and invasive alien species the central government again here the central government may by notification regulate or prohibit the import trade possession or proliferation of invasive alien species which pose a threat to wildlife earlier this was not mentioned in this so all the exotic species or if you if there is a we saw this on chennai custom we saw the whole procedure how the customs department tracks and monitors the import of uh, the smuggling of wild animals most of them were exotic and the problem was the forest department was not empowered to act on exotic animals so it came under the purview of customs act so only the customs authorities they did but they did not have any expertise of animals holding them so there was a, a lack of coordination between them so all those animals were sent back but that country might it should first receive it it should first uh, accept it back those animals so that was a uh, problem now it has been done the central government has been given the power by notification and central government has come out with a notification no need to read that notification only this provision so these were the important sections this again is a photo from range office i can't read kannada so one of you could read you could understand the english name has been cut this was a person a wildlife poacher who was arrested by the department the range officers and and the subordinate force this you will be doing these photos are just for information and uh, for a for some bit of motivation uh, motivation for you guys and we'll continue uh, uh, the rest of the two laws 
uh, I hope I have covered the two laws in, in appropriate detail, not too much detail. I have uh, eliminated all the uh, all the sections which are not relevant for you. And uh, I have kept all the sections which might help you in answering some questions and getting some clarity on as to what are your power and what can you do. Okay. Uh, the rest of the two sections, Forest Conservation Act and the Forest Rights Act. Uh, we'll discuss them in another session, maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow. You might also have been tired or it, already it, would, uh, it might be uh, too much for you to grasp. Yes, Manoj, yeah. yeah. The floor is open for doubt. You know? uh, yes, sir. Sir, I have a question uh, regarding mining. Sir, yes. is mining allowed in protected areas like national parks, tiger no, reserves? No, or? no. National parks and wildlife sanctuary protected areas, you cannot do mining. For mining, you have to divert the land. Because I told you about that provision. Even the soil and all, everything comes under forest produce. Under uh, section, uh, if you go through that PPT again, I'll be sharing that PPT. So when I was discussing Indian Forest Act 1927, the uh, section 2 defined forest produce. And in forest produce, even soil, rock, boulders, everything was covered. And when we discussed Wildlife Protection Act, uh, in the section 27, uh, restrictions in a sanctuary, it was written that no forest produce can be removed from a sanctuary or a protected area. Even that same provision is applicable to national parks. So these two acts make it sure that you cannot do this. You cannot do mining in a protected area. If you want to do a mining, you have to submit a proposal under Forest Conservation Act 1980. Under Forest Conservation Act, you have to get, first is the diversion of forest land. So for that, you have to get the uh, approval of central government. Secondly, you have to get, uh, first was forest clearance. Second is wildlife clearance. So you have to get the wildlife clearance from key wildlife warden. And if it is a protected area, you have to get a clearance from the National Board of Wildlife. And then third is environmental clearance, because it is a mining project. So you have to do an EIA, and you have to get a, a clearance from the pollution control. Then only you can start mining. I hope I'm clear. Manoj? Yes, sir. Sir, I had one more question. Yes. Uh, sir, sir, is there any uh, definition, a legal definition for green cover? Uh, definition for? A green cover, sir. Green cover. Green sir, because, cover, uh, uh, sir, I Green cover uh, as such, but uh, forest cover and forest area have been defined by FSI. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is, there, huh. So that those definitions you might as well be aware of. Yeah, they, these are discussed in all the, yes, all the standard sources. Green cover, there is no standard definition, no legal definition, as far as I know. Yes. Sir, I remember reading it somewhere, uh, saying that uh, Bangalore has a green cover of uh, 13%. Sir, what does that mean? It, it could be uh, including all. So when you talk about green cover casually, you include forest area as well as forest cover, which is outside the recorded forest area, and then the tree outside forest also. So it is basically the green wash. <laughs> The area which looks okay. green in FSI's maps, that is called as green wash. So green wash again is a standard term, but green cover is not a standard term. It is casually used by the news reports and uh, and some some reports, unofficial reports. But in official reports, you won't find this green cover term. Okay, sir. Okay, okay sir. Okay, Manoj. Yes, sir. Sir, sir, one last question, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, sir, 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 is there any legal definition or legal aspects uh, associated with uh, biosphere reserves? Biosphere reserve, there is no legal definition. It, uh, biosphere reserves are declared under Man and Biosphere Program. Okay, so there is no legal definition, not any uh, any definition under the Wildlife Protection Act. It is basically just some area will be declared yes. as biosphere reserve that. It would include the Bandipur Tiger Reserve uh, National Park. It would include the Annamalai National Park. And all these together will be Biosphere Reserve. So it would be just a notification under Environment Protection Act. Because Environment Protection Act, may there is a section. I forgot the exact number of the section. But it empowers the central government to take any steps, uh, any steps it deems fit for the protection of environment. That section is utilized to declare eco-sensitive zone, to declare coastal regulation zone to declare biosphere reserve, everything. And even uh, this uh, elephant reserve. Elephant reserve is also not defined under a wildlife protection act. That again is declared under that power. Okay. 
it is not defined. I hope I'm clear, Manav. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, two cars are ready. And... Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, Manav. Yes, sir. Yes, Prasuk. I think Hello. you are not uh, unmuted yet. Yes, uh, no. Hello. Uh, yes. 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 yes, sir. Yes, sir. In the, in the Indian Forest Act, uh, absolute powers has been given to the Forest Department. Yes. So, do you feel any need for bringing the amendments in that? The amendment has been got experience on the ground. The Jan Vishwas Amendment Act, as I told you, 2023. All the powers which were deemed draconian have been removed. And they were draconian only in the sense of grazing and cattle, because that was associated with the livelihood of the people. Otherwise, all the powers that have been given are related to forest offenses. The power that the arrest without warrant and the, the, the punishment, they are related to encroachment and all. You cannot allow them. So in my opinion, there is no need for further amendment. Uh, already the amendment has been done yeah, and uh, the, the cattle grazing, it has been decriminalized. All the provisions that should have been decriminalized have been decriminalized. All the other provisions, forest officers already, they face many challenges. Yeah, they don't have uh, weapons yeah, as like police. Not every forest officer has a weapon. Yeah, and then the power to shoot is also not given in many areas. So. There are many handicaps. So these provisions are needed for them to discharge their duties effectively. Okay. 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 And uh, one more question is that if uh, someone is uh, residing into the forest area okay. for like 20 years, okay. are there any provisions for the rehabilitation? Yes, there are provisions, yes. Under uh, which in, in Maharashtra, there is a scheme where you will be given land for land. So you will be given an alternate land, the whole village. Uh, we saw a relocated village. So uh, we saw this, uh, the village from where they were relocated. That village was converted into a grassland. And we saw the relocated village also. There are two types of packages. We need not go into those much detail. Yeah. But there are two packages. In one, you are given a land. In one, you are given a lump sum amount of money. 10, 15, 15 lakhs or 20 lakhs. There are specific guidelines by the central government. NPC has given the guy even even if it is a enclosed land what no enclosed land you cannot give no. no no they are not owners of it encroachment you have to evict them it is your duty to evict people who have enclosed the forest land you cannot give them. okay it is illegal and the, uh, what is the status of tiger reserves do they come under the protected area what yes they are protected areas tiger they are not explicitly okay. mentioned in the definition in Wildlife Protection Act, but all the provisions that apply to wildlife sanctuary and national parks, they apply to tiger reserves also. So for all practical purposes, they are protected. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yes, who else? I have a few hands raised. Shashank, Shashank, Shashank Gora. Is it Shashank or Shashank? Uh, you might need to unmute yourself. Sir, uh, is it possible to divert a forest comes under national park or wildlife sanctuary with the what? approval of uh, Supreme Court? No, no, no. To divert, to change the area of a national park, of any protected area, you need the approval of National Board for Wildlife. Okay, sir. It is possible because uh, you might have heard in news about the Kane Betwa project. River linking project. Yes, sir. So around 20 30 percent of Panna Tiger Reserve is being submerged yes, in that project. But that project has got the approval because it is a strategic project. It is related to the livelihood of the people of Bundelkhand region, which is very, very rain deficient. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, alternate arrangements have been made. Okay, so thank you. Okay, okay, sir. Who else? All doubts are clear. Yes, Pranay. Yes. 
Perfect. Uh, unmute yourself first. Can't hear you. Oh, yeah. yes. Can you please repeat on how elephant reserves are notified? How elephant reserves are notified? Yes, sir. So basically, through a notification, the central government issues a notification uh, detailing uh, all the areas that are to be included in that elephant reserve. So there is a Shivalik yeah. elephant reserve. So this Shivalik elephant but, reserve includes Corbett National Park, yeah. Rajaji Tiger Reserve, uh, Corbett Tiger Reserve, Rajaji Tiger Reserve, and a few territorial forest areas of Haridwar Forest Division. Because it so should sir, be a connected is. area. It, if it is a reserve, it should be a connected area. So they are included in two ranges of uh, Haridwar Forest Division. So, so there is no law that is backs it. It's what? just uh, there is no law to back it. No, 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 no. It is it is uh, declared by central government using the provisions of EPA and the the last provision of Wildlife Protection Act. Wildlife Protection Act means the last provision gives the power to central government to make rules for anything for wildlife and all. For the central government, okay. there is no specific provision regarding elephant. There was an elephant preservation act 1879. That was a British era act, so that is still uh, active. So that might have been utilized, but I have not read that act, so I won't be able to comment on that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Who else? Yes, Shashank. Sir, uh, what is the main difference between the bird sanctuary and the wildlife sanctuary, sir? Ah, bird sanctuary is not a legal term. Uh, wildlife sanctuary is the legal term under Wildlife Protection Act. Bird sanctuary is we just uh, it's just in the name. As I told you, there are only four categories: wildlife sanctuary, national park, conservation reserve, and community reserve. So, bird sanctuary is essentially a wildlife sanctuary if it is declared as such. Like uh, uh, any any example, and I'm forgetting an example, but if it is declared under the provisions of under Section 18 of Wildlife Protection Act, it is a wildlife sanctuary. But since it is a very significant bird area. It is named as a bird sanctuary. I told you the case of Desert National Park. So the name is Desert National Park, but it is a wildlife sanctuary. So okay. you declare in that notification itself, you name that area, that these, these areas will be included, and this will be called as Desert National Park. Similar to okay. Bandipur, Bandipur National Park, or Bird Sanctuary, or Kevla Dev, whatever. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Anyone else? I think all doubts are extinguished now. Uh, I can take a sigh of relief. <laughs> so we'll be taking uh, the next session and uh, the Forest Conservation Act. That would be very important because it, uh, it was much in controversy and we will be discussing it in detail. And this is also the most least studied uh, act when we are aspirants. We don't know the provisions because it is a very short act. It is a one page, five section act. All the details are in the rules and the notifications, which nobody reads and nobody should read. Yeah. Uh, and in your place, you should not waste time in reading all the rules and notifications and all. That was the very purpose of conducting this act. Because even when I was preparing, I did not read the act, those uh, these acts were written. So whatever I found in some news articles or some coaching articles, I just read. So I did not have much knowledge about these. But since I have read, so I thought that whatever provisions I know, I should discuss with you so that you get a basic idea of what your powers would be. So whenever you are answering any question on, on situational questions, you know at the back of the mind, you know what are your powers and what are the provisions. So that will make your answer more substantive. Similar is the case with Forest Conservation Act, even more so because we don't study that act. That act is only one line that is most significant, that no forest area could be diverted except with a prior permission from the central government, prior approval of central government. But all the devil is in the details. And there has been recent uh, the, uh, amendments that have changed the act significantly. Uh, Vikas, thank you. Thank you, Vikas, for joining. Uh, that, uh, that amendment has changed significantly so uh, this was a subject of much controversy among wildlife. Uh, even the forest officers, uh, they have uh, some uh, a group of forest officers have taken this act, this amendment to court also, and the matter is subjugated. 
So we'll discuss all those details, the Goda Verman judgment, all these things. Yeah. Whenever I get time, I'll try, I'll, I'll try my best to find time as soon as possible, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, or uh, 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 very soon. And then the last one would be Forest Rights Act. That again is asked in interview because that, that presents a conflict. So we'll be discussing those two. Those of you who are interested and those of you who thought that today's session was helpful, might join us. I'll be sharing the link. I hope Thank you, sir. Was helpful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Okay. 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 Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you for joining. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll take my contact from uh, 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 Statecraft guys. Yeah. And if you have any doubts, 